So welcome back to the second session of this workshop. Second session, I always start with the same question. Did you have any questions, any discussions during the break? Any questions that you would like to ask? Uh, something that I didn't describe well, some concepts that you didn't understand or questions that you have in the context of your own project. I had one question in the break, I would like to show it to everybody. Um, the question was, how do I get a list of repositories or Docker images that are currently stored in my repository? And yeah, this is how you do that. ACR repository list, generally all the subcommands of ACR repository. <laughs> Any other questions? You mentioned there, um, just before the break, I suppose, in terms of stateless services only, uh, and it doesn't we say if you've got a database, it's not, this isn't the tool to use. It's a, uh, Could you repeat the question? You, you, were about, you wouldn't use it for databases. I wouldn't use ACI for databases. Okay. Azure Container Instances. Okay, you can. What you can do with Azure Container Instances, you can mount in Azure Container Instances drives which are backed by Azure Storage and there you can, of course, store persistent state. Let me quickly show you what I mean. So if we go into the Container Instances stuff here, we can take a look. Here are my containers. <coughs> Uh, and in the properties, no, I don't see it interactively. Let me quickly Google that for you and show you how this is done. A Azure ACI mount. So let's switch to English. Yeah. Um, what you essentially see here is that you can create storage accounts in Azure. What is a storage account? Um, Azure Storage is the very base fundamental of nearly everything that works in Azure. Because at some point in time, every service has to store something to disk. Mm -hmm. If you use virtual machines, you have your, your virtual drives, your ISO, your images, whatever. Everything is stored in, in storage. And storage is the fundamental service. It was one of the first services that appeared when Microsoft created Azure. And if, if storage breaks, everything breaks. So storage doesn't break. And what you can do, what you see here, is you can create an Azure storage account, as you can see here, and then create, for instance, there are other options too, but this is the easiest one to understand, a file share. This is essentially an SMB file share as a service, service. So what you do is you just give me, you say, give me a file server as a service and offer me an SMB endpoint that I can use to mount it either locally in Windows or Linux, or I can mount it into a container. And this is what this article is all about. I started the recording, so if you want to look it up later on, you can take a look at the video, or you take a picture, that's also perfectly fine. Uh, and this is how you do it, you see? Azure Container, Create, and down there, you specify the storage account plus the mount path. And if you now store something, into this mount path, this is okay, there you are allowed to store data, and this data is persistent. If you kill the Azure Container instance, data will still be there, because it's not stored in the container, but it's stored outside of the container. And this, this is pretty simple to connect something like this. As I said, there are other options too, please just check the documentation. However, I still, and this is not the official Microsoft opinion, this is the opinion of me, Rhinostropic. I, I had a question in, in the in the break too. I'm not a Microsoft employee. I run my own company. I don't have Microsoft stocks. I'm not on the Microsoft payroll. So I'm an external guy and I can tell you whatever I want about the Microsoft services. So this is now Rhinostropic's opinion. My opinion is don't run your own database in Azure. Use a PaaS or serverless service preferably a serverless service like Cosmos DB or a PaaS service like SQL or MySQL or Postgres or whatever 
and let Microsoft worry about the whole backup and restore and, and uh, failover clustering across data center locations with different earthquake zones and whatever they can do. They do that very, very well. I would not run my own database in Azure, but I would use external storage service. If you must, if you have a proprietary database, for instance, if you, or if you are running a database that is not offered as a service by Microsoft, you can use something like that. Okay? Does that somehow answer your question? Yes, Good. Further questions? Uh, can it be useful like a blue-green deployment? How would you use that? Pardon? Uh, how would you use the service for a blue-green deployment? Mm. There is no specific support for uh, blue-green deployments in Azure Container instances. We will, in a few minutes, take a look in a service that is optimized for running microservices in Azure, and there we have support for that. But in Azure Container instances, if you want something like this, you have to build it on your own, or you use a service that sits on top of this stuff, like Kubernetes, for instance. But built in, you don't have something for it. Third question, from the first break, from the first half. So, let's get started. Let's get started with new topics. The first thing that I would like to discuss briefly with you, because it, it's not 100% connected with, with container, but it's, it's another Azure service that you nearly always use in conjunction with containers, whatever, wherever you use containers, um, it's, it's Key Vault. Key Vault, I don't know if you have heard about Key Vault. Key Vault is a kind of password manager, but not for humans, but for applications. That's what Key Vault is all about. You might use things like KeyPass or Password One or whatever these password managers are, and Key Vault is the password manager for you as a DevOps engineer and for the applications. You can, you can take away one important sentence from this workshop. If you work in Azure, never store any kind of secret outside of Keyboard. Never. Not in your scripts, not in your PowerShell scripts, not in your ARM templates. Never. Whenever you have to store a secret, a password, a certificate, an encryption key, whatever secret you have, store them in Keyboard. And then protect access to Keyboard using Azure Active Directory. Either user accounts, then you have multi-factor authentication and Active Directory integration, all this nice stuff, or use again service principles, the thing that we discussed in the first part of the workshop. Okay. So, for instance, if um, my, my Azure Container instance, my Azure Container instance, in my example, wants to pull down an image from my Azure Container registry. Now the question is, how could my Azure Container instance authenticate with the service principle that is only allowed to pull images and is not allowed to push images? I need to somewhere store this user credentials. You know what I mean? The question is, where should I store them? Should I store them in an environment variable? Should I store them plain text in my DevOps scripts, PowerShell or Bash or whatever? No, I shouldn't. I should always store these things in the Key Vault. And then you handle them like that. You see, here I create a Key Vault. Key Vault is extremely cost efficient. I've never <coughs> seen a project so far where anybody thought about uh, the costs of Key Vault. Key Vault is really very, very cost efficient. And then you can store, and here you see two examples of that, secrets. Every secret has a name, as you can see here, and has a value, as you can see it here. The value can be an arbitrary string. Yes, you can also store certificates in here. Yes, you can store many other types of secrets. But the simplest thing is just a secret. Okay? And then you can define who is allowed to access this key vault. In my example, it's me. I am running this script, so I am the only one accessing this key vault while running this script. But if this would be an automated script, running in, in kind of DevOps automation process, whatever, then it wouldn't be a user accessing this key vault, but it would be a machine, a managed identity. Get the idea? 
The beauty of having all these things in Key Vault is that it's pretty easy or it's becoming easy and maintainable to do frequent password or secret rollovers. This is what we should all do, shouldn't we? Every week or whenever we should change all our credentials, all our certificates. Is everybody doing that? Everywhere? Uh, obviously, <laughs> for most of us the answer is mm, not everywhere. That's already a good answer. Never is the answer that I typically get when I work with customers. So Microsoft thought, let's make it as simple as possible, and Key Vault is exactly that. So let me quickly show you what Key Vault is capable of doing. Um, here we have our Key Vault. Um, currently, if we take a look at access control and view role assignments and say this resource, there are no role assignments because currently the role assignments are inherited by the subscription and the resource group, but you can define exactly what you want here. Um, and here, for instance, we have our secrets. And here you see, for instance, the password for pulling down resources. And if I take a look, I could say, show me the secret value, and this is the generated password. doesn't make any sense. Uh, but the point is, so you could do things like, um, I can today create the password, which is valid from tomorrow on, and I can already insert it to Keywall and set an expiration or activation date. Features like that <coughs> can be found in Keywall. So whenever you run the script, you automatically get the correct password and it's becoming feasible to do password rollers. And if you use managed identity, the thing that I told you in the first half of the workshop, then you don't even have to care about the, the secrets because Microsoft is rolling that over for you. If you want to dive deeper into managed identity, in my YouTube channel I have longer workshops and conference sessions that are recorded on that topic feel free to take a look at the videos. They are all available for free. Good. So, let's take a look how I use it here. I create the key vault. I store a secret for the service principle name and the service principle um, password. And then, when creating the container, I specify, hey, Azure Container Instance, pull down the image, not from the Docker Hub, but pull it from my Docker registry. That command would fail if I just executed like that, because it wouldn't have the permissions to do so. So I have to specify username and password, and this is where the magic of Keywall comes in, because there I can just say, hey, get the, get the secret from Keywall. And with that, I have a script which is free of secrets, I can check it into GitHub and nothing bad will happen because all my secrets are in Keyvault. And Keyvault has a lot of security certifications, essentially in the Microsoft Azure data centers there are hardware appliances where all the secrets are stored and they have um, audit logs that you can read and present to auditors and things like that. So Keyvault is really a good solution, especially in the enterprise context. So what is the takeaway here? Whenever you do something in Azure with containers, also not with containers, store secrets in Key Vault. And Microsoft supports Key Vault nowadays pretty much everywhere you need it. It's not 100%, it's 80%, but it's still good. With managed identity, things are even getting better. They are not supported everywhere already, but month by month, they are, um, they are innovating in that area, and they are widening in support. Questions concerning keyboard? Good? Great. Uh, you can create as many keyboards as you want. Please don't put too many secrets into a single keyboard. It would be a no-go to store development and production secrets in a single keyboard because you define access policies per keyboard, not per secret. Okay? So create a little bit more keywords than they need to Good. This one we did already in the first part. Now, we want to talk about the next service. So in your mind, open a new chapter, okay? We have the chapter Azure Container Registry, first part. We have the chapter Azure Container Instances, second part. And now we have a third big chapter, which is called Azure App Service. 
Azure App Service is a rock star service in Azure. It's one of the most widely used services in Azure, besides databases and storage and VMs and so on. Uh, it's one of the top five, I think, or at least top ten. So it, it has been around for quite a while. And what this, what's that app service all about? It's about running web apps and web APIs based on HTTP, HTTPS, and web sockets in Azure. So whenever you want to run a microservice which speaks HTTP, HTTPS, or web sockets, app service is the way to go. In nine out of 10 circumstances. If you are building very, very, very super large systems with hundreds of thousands of concurrent users, then you might consider other services like Azure Service Fabric and things like that. But typically, the typical business application, the typical business microservice, it's app service. So I visit a lot of customers and help them transition to the cloud. And as I said, in 9 out of 10 circumstances, when they ask me, hey, where should we run our microservices, and when we take a closer look, <coughs> the result is use app service. But the point is, if we use app service, we, don't, we want to reduce the lock-in effect to Azure to a very high degree. So it is okay, as long as we are in Azure, to run it in app service, but we want to have the possibility to run it in our own data center, or to run it in an Amazon cloud, or in a Google cloud, <coughs> wherever, you, wherever you want to run it. So, it is, so Microsoft did the following. They added support for containers to app services. Previously, in the early days of app service, it was Windows only, and they had their own container, or let's say isolation technology, their own sandboxing technology. If you want to know it, the project is called Project Kuru. It's open source, it's great, I love it. We have been using it for many, many years, but it's not based on containers. Don't get me wrong, Microsoft didn't invent a, 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 a competing container technology. Kuru was developed as a point in at a point in time when there was no Docker. Or at least Docker was not that widespread as it is today. Today, Microsoft is catching up and saying, okay, app services, Docker and Kuru, should be on the same level. That's the goal. So today we can use app services with containers, and this is what I would like to show you. The first thing that you do if you create um, an app service is you are creating an app service plan. Let me trigger that command here, and while it runs, I will tell you a little bit about an app service plan. An app service plan is essentially, let's say, a web farm. You are allocating a certain number of machines. Can be one machine, can be ten machines. They are all of the same size. You specify the size per machine. And what you get is a web farm with a reverse proxy that acts as a load balancer. And you can elastically scale this stuff either based on schedule, based on your own manual scripts or portal, whatever or based on certain metrics. You could monitor CPU or queue lengths and things like that and scale up and down just as you need it. So this is not just a single container, this is really a server farm. And here we are deploying the app service plan and that is the thing that we pay for. And then we can add as many containers as we want and they are running inside of this farm. We are not paying for each web app or web API, we are paying for the plan. Okay? <clears throat> and inside of the plan you can stuff in as many containers or as many microservices as you want. And they all scale at the same amount. So you don't scale web API 1 and independently web API 2. All the web APIs or web apps that run in the same plan are scaled up or out in one go. Get it? Okay, so, um, well, the, the script is really simple. AZ app service plan create, blah, 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 and here you define the so-called SKU. B1 is called a basic one. Let me quickly show you how that looks like. This is now a Linux machine, so I am deployed it to the Linux stuff. This is the plan that I just created. And here I can say scale. And let's take a look at the production stuff. And here you see the different images. 
for production purposes, typically use the so-called standard images, an S1, an S2, or S3. It is preferably you scale out, so you add more machines instead of scale up, adding larger machines. So ideally, in a world of modern microservices, each microservice consists of a lot of small machines, not a few big ones. Typical monolithic applications, like we used to develop them 10 years ago or so, they typically rely on only a few or only one big, large web server. And that's not so good, because it's much harder to automatically scale up to right scale when you have to add or remove big machines instead of adding or removing small machines. For development purposes, you have the B machines, the basic ones, they have a little bit limited functionality, but they are much more cost, much more cost efficient for development purposes. These are the, uh, the, the, the list prices, they are not, no, no rebates if you work in a larger company and you have some kind of uh, enterprise agreement, typically these prices are lower, but this is the default price. So just get it. Good. So this is how we create a plan. And the, the really nice thing, and that's, that's really how we live it, day by day. Imagine you have this cute little video of a cat that everybody wants to see on your website. Oh, we need more power. Hit save. Updating our scale configuration. Wait a second. Or five, or ten, something like this. Done. Now, we are having two web servers. And we have a load balancer, and it's sticky, and everything, and once the cat is no longer interesting to people, we can scale down again, and we only have one server left. And you pay for exactly what you really lose. But you see, this is the beauty of app services compared to Azure Container Instances. You wouldn't get this for free in Azure Container Instances. That's the same look and feel that you have from Kubernetes, for instance, if you run a web with Kubernetes. But here, you don't have to run Kubernetes. It's just there. Get the idea? Here you can also, um, I, I'm in the basic tier, this is why I'm limited, you know what, let's scale up to the standard tier, just imagine that we now did the development and now we really want to go to production, so we need full functionality, click on it, and with that, done. See how fast it was? That's real experience, this is how we work every single day, if we decide we need I don't know, double the RAM, we go to the portal or to the script, we click, 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 save, 15 seconds later, all our machines in all our web farms are scaled up and we didn't lose a single HTTP request. This is how app service works. And now you know why web developers like me love this stuff. So, now we have standard functionality. First thing, what we can do is I can now scale up to many more machines to say save. This is live. This is not somehow scripted. Done. We now have 10 instances. And let's go down again. Of course, with a larger application, it takes a little bit longer because it has to copy a few bytes and things like that and warm up time. That depends on your application. But that depends on your application. So here we can say auto scale. Uh, we can, for instance, say, by default, we have three images, but we want to scale based on either a metric, where you can say, okay, when the CPU is higher than this and that, and so on, or we can also define the schedule. Many customers that I work with, they love the scheduling stuff, because they know after 10 p.m. in the night, nobody is caring for their services anymore, and they would like to scale out again at 6 a.m. in the morning. And with a very simple click of a button or a very short script, they can immediately um, save a lot of money. Save 10%, 20%, 30% of their, of their bill. That's the point. Okay. Good. Uh, nope, we don't need to do auto scaling now. I think you can imagine how that works. Okay. Now we have the app service plan, and now we would like to deploy a web app. Uh, and, and just for demonstration purposes, I'm just deploying um, Nginx here again and go for it. This now does a web app create and references the plan. 
The plan is the hosting farm and the web app is now a single API or app. Don't let that name fool you. You don't have to absolutely run a web app here. You can run a web API equally fine. Okay? It's done. Now if we refresh this guy, here it is. Every Azure web app doesn't only get um, an IP address, but we get a fully qualified domain name, which consists of a unique identifier, in our case gather19cweb.azurewebsites.net. So this is the part that you can't choose. On the left-hand side is the part that you can choose. If you are happy with that name, you get an SSL <laughs> certificate for free, maintained by Microsoft. Of course, C names and A records are supported. Of course, custom, um, custom certificates, including Let's Encrypt, with automatic um, SSL certificates, updates, and things like that, they are all in the box. So let's try it, click on it, and let's see. Welcome to NGX. This is exactly what we want. Question. How does Azure notice if somebody else has took this name? Pardon? Um, what if um, somebody else does this? Um, uh, it doesn't work. Name. If I would, if you yeah. now try to use exactly that name, you would get an error that this name is already taken by me. Well, you don't see by me, but Azure will yeah. tell you, no, nope, that's already taken. So Azure cares for uh, unique naming here. Mm -hmm. For some projects, for instance, for APIs, we often use directly the Azure Websites.net domain. Why not? No customer sees it, and we don't have a problem. If people start the development tools in, in Chrome, well, then they see azurewebsites.net. We are fine with that. That's not a problem. But for other, for web apps, for instance, we don't like azurewebsites.net. We use custom domain names for that. Good. So let's click a little bit through what we can do with these web apps. Um, Deployment Center might be interesting for you. Deployment Center means where and how can you deploy the stuff. Essentially, from all the DevOps tools that you know. So you can, for instance, do a webhook that automatically deploys the web app when the image is pushed to the Azure Container Registry. Know what I mean? So web app can listen to the Container Registry and whenever you upload a new image, a new version of the image, it can automatically deploy a new version of the app directly here. That you don't typically do for production purposes, you do that for test purposes. Application settings. Application settings are interesting. What you can do here is um, you can define the HTTP version, and now this one might be interesting. Another important thing when it comes to web APIs, ARR affinity. Mm -hmm. ARR affinity means sticky sessions. If you have a web farm with five nodes, then the same user session typically always reaches, as long as technically possible, the same physical node that raises the number of cache hits that you have. For instance, if you are caching things in memory and things like that. This is done based on cookies. If you don't like cookies, GDPR, then you can turn it off, but then you get round robin scheduling and no longer sticky sessions. But again, a very nice feature that's already there and you don't have to build it on your own. Um, you can, and every, every container gets um, access to local data which is persistent, so it's backed in Azure storage, and you can get for free FTP access if you want. So from outside, you can FTP data up and down. For instance, if you run a content management system, you can use um, FTP to download and upload some content if you want. That's completely optional. Then you can define some settings and so on. Another nice option, of course, all these things can be scripted, um, are path mappings. What you can do here, if we click on plus, we can, again, if you can remember what I told you about ACI, we can mount either files or blob storage into directories into our um, container. Get the idea? So we could, for instance, run the Nginx web server, store our website, our Angular or React application, for instance, in Azure files, and then mount the, the application files into the web server using something like this. It's just like 
Docker run with a dash V volume mount. You know what I mean? But the dash V volume mount now mounts something from Azure Storage or from Azure Files, which is an SMB file share as a service. Get the idea? That's a great feature. We really love this stuff because that gives you a lot of flexibility. Now you can run a web server without any, any Docker file at all and just mount in the static parts that you need or a node application where you can directly mount in JavaScript that you would like to execute. Okay? <clears throat> Some container settings. The container settings are notable because there you have a bunch of features which are really interesting. You can either go for Docker Hub, I will zoom in a little bit, of course, that's not difficult, that's my example now, but you can of course also reference the Azure Container Registry. So you can either pull the images from public Docker Hub or a public registry or directly from the Azure Container Registry. Now I have something to admit, currently, you cannot create from the Azure CLI an Azure Web App that points to an Azure Container Registry. Unfortunately, it's on the backlog. I'm waiting for it. It should be around the corner in the next few something. <laughs> I don't know if they have an announcement already, but it is in GitHub. It is under active development, so it is just a temporary limitation. Today, if you want to do that, you have to do an HTTP post or use PowerShell. Uh, yeah, I'm just a messenger. If you have a multi-container solution, for instance, if you have a microservice which internally uses multiple microservices, think of a Redis cache or in-memory Redis cache or something like this, then you can directly upload a Compose file or a Kubernetes WAML file, a Kubernetes manifest, and what the Azure App Service will then spin up multiple containers that can talk to each other as a single service. <coughs> you don't have to invent or learn and use specification language for that. You can directly use Compose Files and Kubernetes. Word of warning here. This does not mean that Microsoft runs behind the scenes Docker Compose or Kubernetes. This does not support all the possibilities and options of Kubernetes and Docker Compose. You have to check the docs of Microsoft App Service, of Azure App Service, to find out which options are supported and which not. Microsoft just wants to make your life easier by giving you the possibility to reuse existing knowledge. So if you are currently already familiar with Docker Compose, you can reuse that knowledge. If you are familiar with, with Kubernetes manifest files, you can reuse that knowledge. But internally they are analyzing this stuff and translating it to app service language if you want. Get the idea? It's a convenience feature. And please note both features are currently in preview. That means they are not ready for production use. Well, you can use it for production use, but it's your own risk. You cannot call support for help. Well, you can. Maybe they will help you, but they don't guarantee that they will help you. Ah, I forgot something. Here. If I go to the container settings, here, I also have the possibility down there, give it a second. First, this is the continuous deployment to the webhook. Can you remember what I told you? Automatically deploy if something. And down there, you see the output of the whole thing, which is really useful because they are, you need this output for um, troubleshooting purposes. If something goes wrong, here you can download the logs. You can uh, download them, you can refresh them, and of course you can also access them via an API. This one is a very nice one, especially in the enterprise context. Imagine the following situation. You are deploying a small little department app and you want to run it in a container. How do you do authentication? Well, today in the internet, the easiest or the de facto standard is what? OAuth 2 or better OpenID Connect. Are you masters of OpenID Connect? 
well, I think there are only five people in this world who are masters of OpenID Connect. No, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But oh, to make one thing very clear, OpenID Connect isn't trivial. It isn't a trivial thing. If you do something wrong, for instance, forget something by validating the token or using an outdated API or framework, you immediately get some security issues here. So this has to be handled very carefully. What did we do in the past? Anybody used Internet Information Server in the past? There was a magic checkbox to check integrated Windows authentication. You were done. Kerberos tickets were doing magic things and suddenly a user was authenticated with his or her single sign-on uh, stuff. That was very easy as a developer because I just had to tick a box and I was done. With OpenID Connect, that's much more complicated. So what Microsoft did is they created a feature which is called Easy Auth, like authentication. Essentially, it's Windows Auth for the cloud. What you do is you say either Azure Active Directory or Facebook or Google or Twitter or Microsoft account. In the enterprise context especially, that one is important. You just say Azure Active Directory protected. And then what Microsoft does for app services, they are putting a reverse proxy in front of your application. If somebody comes in unauthenticated, they are redirecting to Azure Active Directory, means you have to authenticate with single sign-on and multi-factor authentication and blah, blah, blah. And then they will pre present you the identity of the user on a silver tablet, meaning in the, uh, in the headers of the web request, so you don't have to do a complex open API thing, you just have to take a look into um, an HTTP header, which is a trivial thing to do for a developer. You know what I mean? This feature is very, uh, very nice if you work in an enterprise scenario. Of course, if you run your own OpenID Connect server, like for instance we do in our software serve solution, this is not as useful. But in an enterprise scenario, where if it happens to build a, a Facebook app, whatever, then this might also be of great help. The reason why I talked so much about that is I wanted to make it very clear what the advantage of app service is compared to, for instance, Azure Container Instance. You could run your microservice in Azure Container Instances instead of App Service. But would you get scale out with automatic load balancing? No. Would you get auto scale? No. Would you get something like Easy Auth? No. You see, this has been built for web apps and web APIs and microservices in this scenario. By the way, if you ask yourself whether this can only be used on the internet, no. Azure App Service can also be used in virtual networks in Azure. So you can create your own VNet in Azure. You can cut public internet access and only connect your VNet through a VPN tunnel with your enterprise, uh, with your enterprise network. And with that, you get all these features from within your enterprise network without anybody having the possibility to access this stuff through the public internet. That is an option that you have. Please be aware that VNet protected so-called isolated environments um, cost a little bit of money. There is a base fee of approximately 1,000 euro per month that you have to pay to start. If you are a large enterprise and you are running dozens or hundreds of these things, then this 1,000 euros base fee doesn't matter because you pay so much money, it, it really doesn't matter. But if you just want to run a single service, then this might be a little bit of a showstopper. And you have to come up with a different solution. Either you accept that it's accessible through the public internet, um, or uh, come to me if you have this problem. I can give you some tips how to get around it. That you can get around it for you. Okay. Good. So this is easy off. Um, what else do I want to do? I mean, these things are self-explanatory. App service plan. Um, this is also very interesting um, because changing the app service plan. Um, can you remember what I told you? Just to recap, the app service plan is the unit of scaling, right? And the web app lives inside the app service plan. You pay per plan, not per web. So what's that all about? Well, think of the think of uh, how we work as software as a service providers. We have many, many tenants. Tenants meaning customers who have their isolated environment. 
we might have one super large tenant and we dedicate a whole app service plan to this super large tenant. Then we have a lot of medium tenants. We put them together into one separate app service plan. And then we have a lot of, let's say, freemium or very less, uh, or clients that pay only a little amount of, uh, little amount of money for each month for our service. And we can put a lot of them into another app service plan where performance isn't that much of an issue. And now things happen over time. The small customers become medium ones, the medium become large ones, the large ones are scaling down and suddenly are medium ones. So what do I have to do? I never have to redeploy. That's the important thing. With that feature, I can shuffle around my web apps and web APIs between app service plans just as I need them. And it's, and it's happening behind the scenes. I don't have to do the hard uh, stuff and I don't get downtimes. This can be done without any downtime. Another feature, another important feature when it comes to microservices in a software as a service program. Get the idea? Good. Um, what you also get um, is you get SSH directly into your server. So if you take a look at that one, uh, give it a second to load. some kind of permission thing doesn't matter if you correct if you configure it correctly I don't want to spend time now with that you get an SSH connection into your web farm that's not a specific one but you get an SSH connection yeah. on your entire farm and there you can for instance access the persistent storage copy files shuffle files around uh, ad hoc uh, take a look at logs and things like that because otherwise you might be stuck if something goes wrong because you cannot directly access the underlying machines they are hidden from you and therefore they have to present you some kind of remote control to, for your machines you can also use these so-called advanced tools here you see them for instance you can take a look at the environment variables um, you can open a bash file, you can see the files which are current, where they are stored, in which directories you can download the Docker logs as TIP and things like that. So um, App Service gives you a lot of features that you can use in trouble for target shooting purposes. But you can never directly access the machines. They are hidden. Okay? That's pass. Good. And with that, we have our web. Good. Um, this works for Linux containers, and since recently, it also works with Windows containers. So what we can now do, I've not, I've not created a script for that. We can say web apps for container, web apps for container, and since recently, if you might have some, let's say, um, legacy application on Windows that you still have to run but you want to run it in the same way as usual, you can say Windows App Service Plan create a new one. Let's create the DevOps Gather Win. Put it to West Europe. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And this is the point where it's getting interesting. Now I can say Docker Hub and I could, for instance, say Microsoft slash IX. I will not do that, but this is how it works. So the whole UI, the whole user experience is exactly identical. You can use it for Windows and for Linux containers. The feature set is the same. So if you want to run an ASP.NET, for instance, application, you can do that with exactly the same tooling. You can use the Azure CLI to deploy, you can run Docker images with it, and you can, apps, you can use App Service for it. <coughs> to be honest, containers on Windows are not as much fun as containers on Linux. That's the point. So if you can choose, don't use containers on Windows. However, if you are a master of containers, and you love containers, and you have this old app 
with ASP.NET who nobody cares about anymore, nearly nobody, you still have to run it, then you can use Windows Contacts well. Okay? And it's supported. It's also supported with add container instances. Clear? Distinction? Good. Good. So we are reaching the end of this new chapter app service, okay? And now it's important for me that you tell me whether you have now a clear picture in your mind what's the difference between Azure Container Instances and App Services. App Services is for web apps and web APIs, optimized for this stuff. ACI, generally usable. Whatever you want to run, run it there. But don't expect specializations on web apps and things like that. Good? I think I forgot one feature. Let me quickly <coughs> look at that one. Yes, I forgot one feature. I'm very sorry about that. I kicked, I was too fast. Um, let's create that one. And that feature is important because you asked me. Uh, you asked when I described uh, Azure Container Instances for Blue Green deployment or any kind of Canary releases or something like this. And this is now supported in App Service. I didn't mention it, so I would like to, uh, to create here. What you can essentially do is you can create for each web app, not plan, web app, you can create so called deployment slots. Technical deployment slots are nothing else than a second separate web app. But the beautiful thing is, once you have created this stuff, you can do two things. First, you can do swapping. So, you deploy the new version in test or pre-prod or whatever you like to call it. The old version is in production. And now the test has been tested, everything is okay. Now comes the special day, it should be get into production. All you do is you hit the swap button and then this happens. Production becomes test, test becomes production. The settings can be swapped but don't need to be swapped. So you can have settings that are swapped and you can have settings, think of test database connection, production database connection, that are not swapped. So you can mark each, each setting whether it's a slot setting or not. So you swap. That happens with guaranteed no HTTP request lost. That's important. So you now have a new production system and then you monitor the new production system. Azure has its own monitoring and telemetry solution which is called Application Insights. It's great, I love it. We have been using it for many, many years and we can't live without it anymore. So you typically take a look at Application Insights and see, do I have no fake requests? Do I have no uh, unhandled exceptions and things like that? And if everything is good, then it's good. But if something did go wrong, you can press the swap button again and then your old production system is the new production system again. So you have a kind of safety net. You know what I mean? And you can create uh, many of these deployment slots. I don't know the, the maximum limit. Please look it up. If you want to be even more fancy, you can do traffic shaping, as you see here. So you can say, hey, put 20% of my sessions onto a new version. And then 50%. And if Application Insights is still okay and says no unhandled exceptions, performance looks still great, then you can do the swapping. Get the idea? That's also built in. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. And this is the feature that you don't get from this guy. But you get it. A few words at the beginning. I'm a big fan of Docker. 
I'm also a big fan of Kubernetes, but we don't run a single Docker host on our own, and we only have a very small Kubernetes server running for all our systems that we run. Why? Because maintaining a server or a Kubernetes cluster isn't the trivial thing to do. Even if you have managed Kubernetes, as you will see in a second, it isn't a trivial thing to do. So what I would like you to take at home from this workshop is, if you just want to run a bunch of microservices, don't automatically run Kubernetes in Azure. You have now seen a lot of features that you can use without any kind of Kubernetes server, any kind of Kubernetes cluster. Only use a Kubernetes cluster if you really need it. And if you go for Kubernetes, now that's again the opinion of Rainer Schrott, not the opinion of Microsoft. If you go for Kubernetes in Azure, make your life easier by not storing state in the Kubernetes cluster. You can easily combine a Kubernetes cluster in Azure with other platform as a service and serverless features for storing data. I would always prefer a hosted SQL, a managed SQL instance in, in Azure, which is a fully managed service over SQL Server on Linux running inside a Kubernetes cluster in Azure. I would simply not do it in Kubernetes. I would always go for the platform as a service offerings first. And only if I have really strong arguments against them, I would consider running these things in Kubernetes. Do you understand this argument? Are you, um, are you okay with it or do you have a different opinion? I know that, that, that there are arguments against what I say. Hi, there is a strong Docker workflow already established in the company. I think that, that would not be the best fit to switch to the remaining <laughs> services, but that's the only one I can think of currently. Mm -hmm. If you are if you come new to Azure and you have an existing workflow and pipeline with that is fully fully oriented towards Kubernetes and Docker and so on, that might be an argument why you want to run it um, inside of, of something like this. However, if you take a look at Azure SQL database, at Postgres, at MySQL and so on, these things are de facto no ops, not even dev ops. You create, we have, we maintain more far more than 200 database clusters, SQL database clusters in our team. And we have zero, zero administrators. Zero, no, no one. So even if you have a strong Docker pipeline, you can get rid of parts of it because you don't need to run it anymore. It, of course, it's nice, but I think, and now I'm, provo I'm provocative a little bit. Um, everybody has to think of why you want to have this Kubernetes cluster. Sometimes in enterprises, especially with um, nerdy DevOps engineers like I am, I love code, I love playing with this stuff, we have to think of, are we professionals? Are we <coughs> professional enough to do it our own, on our own? Or is this a kind of maker hobby, you know what I mean? Can we run this pipeline as good as Microsoft can run the PaaS or serverless services for, for instance, systems that handle state? In many cases, at least in my company, our answer is no, we can't. The Microsoft Teams do a better job when it comes to storing data and protecting data, um, especially when it comes to state. So that's a question everybody has to ask itself. If your Teams is large enough, or if you have this knowledge, then you are in a different situation than I am, then all the things that I'm going to show you are really valuable to you. But I just wanted to make sure that in this room, out of I don't know how many people, I bet that at least half of the people don't absolutely need to go down the Kubernetes way just because you want to base your application in Azure on container. That's the point that I want to make. Not saying that it doesn't make sense and not saying it's a wrong decision. I just say, be honest to yourself and question this decision. And if you decide to go for it, have fun. Yeah? You will definitely be successful with it and it will be a lot of fun. Good, so now let's take a look at how we can create a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster. First, we have to uh, register um, a provider with Azure Container Registry. That, that's not that interesting. This is the interesting one. 
this line. Let me start it. And we should see something like running here in a second, and then I will discuss. Yeah, good, 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 good. So, if I make it a little bit smaller, yes, that's good. Let's do it like that. Creating a Kubernetes cluster in Azure is a one line. AKS, oops, sorry. AKS create, which resource group, what is the name of the cluster, how many machines do you, ah, how many machines do you want to have? Yes, you can specify the size of the machines. So this Kubernetes stuff is no longer uh, serverless. This is platform as a service. You have to think about how many machines do I want to have. You have to think about how large should these machines be. It's not like ACI where you just say, uh, I want to spin up container instances and please scale it for me. No, this is now platform as a service, not serverless. Then a bunch of security related stuff like generate SSH keys, where do you want to have it, what should be the client secret and the service principle, which we get from Key Vault. By the way, this is the service principle that is pulled down from Key Vault in order that Kubernetes can pull images from our Azure Container Registry. So Kubernetes in Azure is very tightly integrated with Container Registry. If I would run Kubernetes in an enterprise scenario in Azure, I would definitely combine it with Azure Container Registry and use something like that, Azure Active Directory Service Principle, to combine them. So let Kubernetes just read images. Good? And that's, that's de facto it. You, have more, you, you cannot do much more. So let's take a look what's happening behind the scenes. Here we have our DevOps gathering and what we already see here is our Kubernetes service. Once this has been created, creating a Kubernetes service takes approximately 10 minutes, typically. Uh, we'll see. Um, once this has been created, we can get, go into there and do the maintenance stuff. We can take a look at it. We only have a limited set of options. What we get is an Azure Active Directory protected version of Kubernetes, but it is the Kubernetes that you know and love. It is not a Microsoft implementation of it. It's the open source Kubernetes. The product that you buy here with AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service, is the operations part not the product. The product is open source. So they use the Kubernetes that you are used to. So you use your Kubernetes tools, you use kube control to access the Kubernetes cluster. You use the same manifest files. The access is protected by Azure Active Directory and of course other services, especially storage, is tightly integrated into Kubernetes. So what you can do is you can create, for instance, persistent volume claims which which point to Azure storage. So if you create um, persistent volumes, they are stored in Azure storage, which is a highly available and uh, geo-replicated cluster of storage machines. Okay, that's important. If you have to store state, use persistent volume claims in Azure storage and yeah, store your data there. Your machines and everything else is not stored in this resource group. What's happening behind the scenes is that whenever you create a Kubernetes cluster, Azure creates a separate resource group that you see here that is maintained automatically. And that is essentially what AKS is. AKS is a bunch of scripts that the Microsoft DevOps engineers wrote for you and you have a nice API and portal experience where you can do some configurations and they are maintaining the, the scripts behind the scenes. But you can take a look at how they do it by taking a look in this resource group. So we can click in that resource group and there we see a bunch of things. Let me enlarge that a little bit. We have a network security group, which does what the name suggests, routing tables, <coughs> Let's sort this. We have NIX, Network Interface Cards. I decided to go for a three-node cluster. Therefore, we have three virtual machines, as you see it here. 
Um, we have a VNet where this stuff runs. We have an availability set. Availability set is the possibility for Microsoft to scale out a cluster of virtual machines. So we really see what's going on behind the scenes. But now a word of warning, don't change anything here. If you change anything here, things break. <laughs> this is just for you to take a look. There are tiny bits of things that you can do. For instance, you can add descriptive keys and values so you find your resources. So you, uh, if, you, if you take a look at one of these virtual machines, for instance, there is something which is called tagging. Essentially what you do here is you are adding flags or descriptive names to your resources in Azure. And you can use these names for queries, for instance. How many virtual machines do I have that belong to application X? So you could add custom tags here that will not break something, but never change some of the existing ones. If you change some of the existing ones, you don't have a managed Kubernetes cluster anymore. You're on your own. So best way is, don't touch this resource group. Then you're on the safe side. If you read in the documentation, you should do it. Well, then you now know where to do it. But essentially, yeah. That's an exception from the rule. Yeah, our AKS cluster is now ready. So let's take a look. Um, you see the number of possible things that you can do with this community cluster is pretty limited. Um, you can do an upgrade uh, if you want. If you um, here we are currently in 1.11.8. We can now click here and hit save, and then it will update our cluster automatically. Yeah? So we don't do that manually. This is done automatically. Um, operating system security patches and Kubernetes security patches are also installed automatically um, by by the Azure Cloud you have to care for rebooting your images. There is a, uh, rebooting your, your VMs, your nodes. There is a separate documentation article where you have the different scenarios, how you can schedule reboots and things like that. It's not complicated, it's pretty simple to do. But yeah, most of the things are done automatically. They do not do upgrades automatically for you. Because Microsoft considers a switch from 1.11.8 to 1.12.5 such a critical operation that you have to trigger it manually whenever it fits to your needs. Okay? Good. And of course, we can scale. So currently, we have three. So in my subscription, I could scale up to 100 of these machines. So that would then be 200 virtual CPUs and 700 gigabytes of memory. No, I will not hit save now. I hope you forgive me. Good. Now let's play a little bit with this Kubernetes cluster. First, we have to connect to this Kubernetes cluster. And of course, we need to somehow connect to the Kubernetes cluster with um, um, with, an, uh, with, a, with a kind of username, with a principle, and a secret. And in this case, it's a secret key. And if I do that, I run AZ AKS get credentials. The point is that this. This name already used because, um, yeah, I, of course, I tried the demo before entering stage, of course, because I don't want to watch you debugging my scripts here on stage, and therefore the name was already taken. So I have deleted my config file here, and now um, I have the, the name available. And this is also important because now I can show you that this is nothing special. You see, this is now the whoops, this is now the credential. I am here, blah 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 blah, where do I have it? Here, this is our cluster, you see that one? And you see the name and the user and the client certificate and all this thing. 
and these inf this information was added by this statement here that I executed with the Azure CLI. So I use the Azure CLI to get the username of the client certificate associated with my Azure user credentials that I got using multi-factor authentication, Azure Active Directory, you get the idea. And that maintains my cube um, configuration files for me. Get the idea? Now I'm connected with my Azure Kubernetes cluster using the Azure CLI. And now we can issue Kubernetes commands. For instance, run that one. You can get nodes. And now you see, if I zoom in a little bit, here we see our three nodes in Azure. Uh, they are running this and that version, and yeah, it's just Kubernetes. Now, have fun with the whole Kubernetes stuff. Of course, I would like to show you um, a short demo here. Um, I have created a very, very simple application, an application manifest for this demo here. I have more complex ones, but this I typically do in Kubernetes workshops. So this one is a very simple one. Get that one away, get that one away. Very simple. I have one pod, which uses again the web server, Nginx Alpine. And the important one that I want to uh, use in order to speak a little bit about the integration of Kubernetes with other services, um, in this case, I'm using a load balancer in front of my pod. Okay? This load balancer, as you know, if you uh, have a little bit of knowledge about Kubernetes, enables us to access this pod through the public network interface card. In, in our case, through the public internet. So whenever we create a load balancer in Kubernetes, in Azure, in a Kubernetes cluster, we get a public IP address in Azure that we can use to access the service. If you create um, a node port, that's of course not the case. Then you don't have a public IP address. So let's deploy this guy. Here we are. Let's deploy this guy. Papa, I'm in the wrong directory, I'm very sorry. Try again. Good. That's it. Just Kubernetes as you know and love it. So we can do a cube code, get services. Um, let me press enter a few times and then stop zooming a little bit. That's our service. And please note here <coughs> external IP pending. So what's going on behind the scenes? Behind the scenes, now, the Azure Kubernetes cluster is using the Azure API to allocate an IP address and assign this IP address to a load balancer, which becomes now part of our Kubernetes cluster. So it's maintaining, it's doing all the necessary infrastructure as a service work in order to make Kubernetes run nicely integrated in our Azure environment. We don't have to do anything in order to get a public IP address. So, we can do a watch here. So, we will be notified as soon as the external IP is available. It will take, I don't know, a minute or so, something like this. Get the idea, approximately? Yeah? While this is running, um, yeah, I don't want to wait because that would be uh, boring. Uh, we have to assign a little. Oh, I should have run that one before. I have to wait. Any questions so far concerning the Kubernetes stuff? So far, what do you have seen? I will show you a little bit more. We have quarter of an hour left. You get the idea? Is it completely worryless? No. It takes away a lot of the burden that you have in order to set up a Kubernetes cluster or do version management. Is it a trouble-free solution where you can forget about Kubernetes at all and just concentrate on your app and your manifests? No. The last, let's say, 20% or whatever you have to configure, it, it's up to you to do that. So, ha, you see? We got an external IP. Very good. Let's try that one. <coughs> if I didn't screw it up, we should see an Nginx web server. Just saying I'm a Nginx web server, nothing else. Come on.
come on, all of them was worked, so I expect this one to work too. Here we are. Yes, yes, yes. And Genix WebServer. This is now um, uh, um, a port based on the Genix Alpine running in a Kubernetes cluster that we made from scratch. Again, this, this demonstration should make it clear how powerful this concept of platform as a service is. We are done. We, this is production ready quality of a Kubernetes cluster. We can't immediately go live with this stuff. And we created it from scratch. We can focus to a very large degree to what we really want. Delivering solutions to our customers. Now we can of course do a little bit of customization if we want. But this is not the talk. What, <coughs> what we can do, let me quickly run that one. This is just a little bit of security. You can read about it in the docs. Oh, sorry. I have to first this one, this one, this one. Good. So, um, we can take a look at what's going on by running the Kubernetes <coughs> dashboard. And this works the following way with Azure. You have, unfortunately, for that, you can't do that um, solely on an open, uh, on an SSH connected Linux server somewhere in the cloud. So now I have to use my local machine because what's happening in the background is we are creating a local proxy that is accessing with my credentials the Kubernetes server in the cloud and therefore I need to run locally. Um, so let's do a quick AC login <coughs> from my machine. Wrong web browser. Security is so unconvenient. So let's do the AC login again. Correct web browser. I'm already signed in. So now my session should be connected. AZ account set sub subscription. I have to select the right subscription because I have a lot of them. Whoops. Good. And then use that one, but the resource group is called. Bear with me for just one more second. DevOps gathering. I'm copying the text because I tend to mistype things. And the name of the Kubernetes cluster gather 19 AKS. Good. Now, my RCLI um, knows who I am, Rhinostropic. It's now running a local proxy into the cloud. See that one? This proxy is using my credentials as Rhinostropic, which are Active Directory credentials. So, enterprise, single sign on, everything is given. And now I'm accessing, oh, that's a little bit too large. Um, maybe do it like that. Now I'm using the Kubernetes dashboard through a local proxy that does authentication for me so I have Azure Active Directory single sign on to the Kubernetes dashboard. And there I can take a look at my pods and here you see this is our pod, this is exactly the pod that we, that we just deployed a few minutes ago and somewhere here we should see the services and here you have the service with the cluster IP and the internal endpoints and you see the external exploits and all these things. So, as you can see here, th this demo should show you that um, the Azure CLI was extended when they run Kubernetes to make it very convenient and easy to, as, as, a, as a developer, as a DevOps engineer, to access your Kubernetes cluster through the Azure CLI so you don't have to do complex authentication stuff in order to access it with your Azure Active Directory credentials. Get the idea? And this is why I couldn't run it in the cloud, because it wouldn't help me if the proxy was running on a Linux server somewhere in the cloud and yeah, it would be too complex. This is why I had to run it here. Look. What else is in the box but what I didn't create or uh, what didn't show you already? Two things I would like to mention. I don't need that one. Oh, let's have a nice background image. Yeah, that's good. 
Um, two things I would especially like to mention here. First, as I told you, Azure Storage is deeply integrated with Kubernetes. So whenever you have to store bits persistently, you should use Azure Storage which with persistent volume claims, either with Azure Files or with Azure Cloud Storage. There are documents in the documentation how to set it up in Kubernetes and in Azure. It's not very complicated, but you have to do it. First thing. Second thing, and this one is getting really interesting. There is in preview an integration of Kubernetes with Azure Container Instances. What does that mean? What you essentially get is a virtual kubelet with which you can use Azure Container Instances as a scale-out mechanism for Kubernetes. So you have your Kubernetes cluster with a certain size for the typical payload of your applications and if you need to suddenly scale out because you have a, a wave of new things coming in or you have a burst of things, background tasks or whatever you have to do that are too large for your entire cluster you can then combine Azure Container Instances and use Azure Container Instances as your scale out mechanism for Kubernetes Get the idea? And now you maybe know why Microsoft created these Azure Container Instances you might have asked yourself, well, these Azure Container Instances, they are, they are nice, but as a standalone service, they are somehow too trivial, too simple to really be useful. But the whole plan, the whole strategy of these Azure Container Instances is to have something that is trivially to spin up and remove again, because we need a system that is capable of breathing, scaling out and scaling in. Of course, we could add new virtual machines to our Kubernetes cluster, but this is already too heavyweight. We need to be able to spin out on a much lower, core, uh, much, much uh, smaller granularity. You know what I mean? If we need more power, add a bunch of ACIs and get rid of them very fast again and only pay for the CPU seconds that we need while we scale out and then we scale back to the thing that is, that is normal and that is reserved. <clears throat> Get the idea? I think this is a, a really interesting combination using Kubernetes with ACI. We are just at the beginning of this journey. As I told you, this integration is, as far as I can remember, currently in preview, so it's not ready for production use. But you see the strategy and the, the, the kind of thing that is currently going on in the direction that Microsoft is heading towards. Microsoft has a strong investment in Kubernetes in Azure. So Microsoft really wants to make the message very clear. If you want to use Kubernetes, we want to be there for you. We want to be one of the leading clouds providing Kubernetes as a service in the public cloud. Okay? Good. This is just a little bit of demo uh, I typically do in, in longer workshops. Uh, where we use uh, Azure storage to store data persistently with persistent volume claims and so on. Just take a look at the scripts, you can take a look at that at home. I don't want to continue with this demo here, it doesn't make, doesn't add additional information in this three hour version. So, time flies. Our goal, what I promised you, is that we take a look in multiple chapters at the different systems that Microsoft offers in terms of platform as a service and serverless in the Azure cloud. And we have multiple big chapters. We have the container registry, the container instances, the app services, and the Kubernetes stuff. And I tried to make it yeah, uh, as practically as possible by not showing you some kind of boring slides, but showing you real demos with real scripts and created everything today from scratch so you really see this can be done and this can be achieved. I showed you a bunch of surrounding services. For instance, Key Vault, Storage. We talked about some database services. We talked about some tooling like the Azure CLI, PowerShell, the, the Shell portal where you can do some scripting directly in the browser. So you see that this, what, what this package has already. I personally, I, I want to tell you that because that's important for me, 
I do, I do not work for Microsoft. So sometimes I get criticism like, hey, he, he, this guy is trying to sell us something. I'm not trying to sell you something. If you use Azure or not, I don't get any cent of, of money here. That's, that's not the case. I'm really convinced um, of, of Azure. That's just my personal thing. But what I'm even more convinced, can take any other cloud if you want, that the platform as a service and serverless road is the most important decision and the most important, let's say, productivity boost if you go to the cloud. It doesn't make much sense to use the cloud just for infrastructure virtualization. You don't need a cloud for that. The power of the cloud is to, to give away some responsibility to the cloud <laughs> and let, let them care for some of the DevOps automation and let us concentrate on what we really want to do, provide value to our customers. That was the motivation for me to suggest this workshop at this conference here and I hope I didn't do a too bad job to, to show you that and bring that point to us. We only have a few minutes left and I want to open it up for questions. If you have any questions that you would like to discuss here in the plenum already, While you think of the questions, let me quickly put the link to the, to the script that you have seen um, here again. Feel free to take a picture. By the way, all my materials are MIT licensed. Take it, share it, re-deliver it, do whatever you want with it. Um, I put the uh, recording on YouTube. It's also available for free. Do whatever you want with it. Um, and yeah, if you find any mistakes or whatever, feel free to send me pull requests in my GitHub repositories or send me a like if you like the, the repository, whatever. Um, by the way, this link brings you to a GitHub repository. And if you go some folders up, you will find a folder which is called Slides. I did not use any slides here today. That does not mean that I don't have slides. I have a lot of slides for them. Again, they are MIT licensed. Take a look at it. If you find something that is useful, take it, re-deliver it, share it, whatever you want to do. Okay? So just look around in my GitHub repositories and maybe you will find some interesting stuff. There. questions. We are nearly on time. Five minutes left. I think that's a good time management. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the DevOps gathering here and I hope we will see each other in the future in any other DevOps gathering or something like this. Okay, thank you very much. Enjoy the evening. Thank you.